Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, we're going to find out if the builder's kits from AliExpress are any good. In this case, this builder's kit includes an Intel Xeon processor, a CPU cooler, a GTX 750 Ti graphics card, 16 gigabytes of ECC RAM, and a Wanon G uh, DDR3 compatible motherboard. The kit does not include a hard drive or a power supply, but I have a hard drive spec'd out here, $44 for a 512 gigabyte SSD, and I have a power supply that I bought on AliExpress and featured in a previous video that I can also use. All right, I'm just opening it up now. Well, there's the first thing we've got. Here is our graphics card. Looks like it's in another anti-static bag. Wusan tested. Looks like this is our GTX 750 Ti. Oh, there it is. I see two fans on it. Fancy looking fans. They have like dragon faces on them. That's kind of cool. Runs off a of PCIe, uh, PCI Express port. And yeah, we've got, uh, looks like VGA, DVI, and HDMI. So yeah, there's our graphics card. And if seal found broken, please verify the contents. It's broken now. Ooh, it looks like we've got some peripherals. We've got a SATA cable. That's convenient. We don't have to get a SATA cable. Some standoffs, maybe. And what else? Here's our actual motherboard. Looks like we've got an I.O. shield. A protector for CPU. I wonder if the CPU is already loaded into the board. The board is smaller than I expected. I was thinking it would be like a full-size server board, but it looks like maybe mini ATX. So here it is. It's in an anti-static bag, which is nice. And yes, the CPU is already installed. It just even has some thermal compound on it, as is the memory. Very nice. So supposedly there's 16 gigabytes. These are supposed to be eight gigabytes per stick. So this should be a 16 gigabyte system. Looks like we've got nice heat sinking on our uh, voltage regulators, our VRMs. And the North Bridge or South Bridge, I can never remember which this is, has a heat sink as well. BIOS, I think, has a heat sink. Now it does not have a CMOS battery, but that's just a CR2032. I can stick that in, no trouble. While I'm waiting for the CPU cooler to show up, I can get started with the rest of the build as it stands, which should just press fit into place. And yep, now they're lined up. So that is excellent. ATX power is connected to the board. All right, here is a CR2032 CMOS battery. So that should be in place now. So there's our graphics card in place. Next. So here's our Golden Fur SSD. Theoretically, there'll be nothing loaded on this, and it's going to get reformatted regardless. There it is. It's not very heavy. It might be interesting to take it apart just to see what's inside. And in case you're wondering, that is what the inside of a 512 gig SSD looks like. We've got three of the four chips populated on either side. It's possible at least one of those chips is there for redundant wear leveling. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Controller, chips, some power regulation. Not a lot to it, and opening the box was actually quite easy. Of course, I've ripped the warranty void sticker, but it's not like I'm going to send this back uh, if I ever actually have a problem with it. There's power. So the SATA drive is hooked up, so we have hard drive. We'll just set that aside for now. Now, I should note at this point that the CPU cooler advertised in the product description did actually ship, but it took a couple weeks longer than the rest of the motherboard and components. In the meantime, so that I could get the system up and running, I bought another CPU cooler from Amazon, but later on I do in fact go back and put on the CPU cooler that originally came from the seller on AliExpress. My CPU cooler has now arrived. This is a Gamax 400 by Deepcool, and supposedly it does fit this processor. So I'm going to open up the box and we'll see if this indeed does work. So I'll put some thermal compound on the chip initially. I've been told roughly a grain of rice sized amount of this compound is good. That's probably about right. That may be slightly too much, but I think it'll be okay. It shouldn't get too close to the edge of the processor where it can cause short circuits. And now I'm going to go ahead and mount up the processor or the uh, heatsink. So this could be slightly complicated because this is adjustable size, so I have to get all of these snap fittings in correctly. 
So those two appear to be mounted in the board. Let me see if I can get the other two in. We got that one in. The last one is having a tough time going in. Yeah, I'll have to check that last one. Let me rotate this around. Yeah, this one is not snap fitting the way it's supposed to. All right, now it's snap fit. I've also reinstalled the fan in place. Now I've configured it as a push fan, so it's going to push air into the heatsink, and I've placed it on the side where the VRMs are located. I'm hoping this will produce some turbulence around the VRM heatsink that should keep the VRMs a little bit cooler as it sucks fresh air into the CPU cooler. All right, I've set up the computer, and I'm using the television as a monitor via the HDMI cable. So what I'm gonna do first is energize the system. I'm just gonna turn on the switch to the power supply. And it looks like not much is happening yet. What I'll do is I'll take some tweezers and I'll jumper out the startup button. So the startup button's on. Now it seems to have turned back off. Maybe I need to do that. Oh, it looks like it had a, an initial startup. Let's go ahead and watch the monitor. So the monitor is still showing no signal. No signal. Well, oh, it's doing something. Hey, it's posted. American Megatrends. And it says, let's see if you can see that, 3.05 gigahertz. And it's got all the memory. All right, so we're at the BIOS screen. Let's see if we can get in. Looks like the CMOS settings are incorrect. So we'll see if maybe we can set the date. It says F1 to run setup. All right, we're in the BIOS. Let's see what we can see here. And yeah, it says reboot and select proper boot device or insert media and selected boot device and press a key. So yeah, I think that it doesn't recognize the USB device. So maybe I'll have to find something else. All right, I'm trying enabling the plug and play OS option to see if that allows it to boot from the USB device. All right, well, it just loaded into Ubuntu. So let's see what it does next. It's booting into Ubuntu. This is great. All right, well, I was able to successfully install a Linux distribution on the computer, and so far things have been working very well. I'd like to show a couple of interesting quirks with the graphics card, though, uh, before I go forward and continue on the process. Now, by default for this television, Linux installed drivers that allowed the graphics card to output up to 4K, and that's what it defaulted to. Uh, however, I noticed an interesting quirk, which is if I open up a video looking at it in 4K, for example, this one, and if I go to full screen, what will tend to happen, and I'll pull it forward a little bit, is it'll get these weird green flashes. And I initially suspected this meant the graphics card was completely toast. This struck me as a hardware problem, and it very well could be. Uh, however, I actually suspect this is more an issue with the output driver for the HDMI controller than the GPU itself. The reason being, as I'll show shortly, that I can run a stress test, a GPU stress test, with no problems. Furthermore, if I switch the resolution to 1080p, which is 10, let's see, 1920 by 1080, I can go up to 60 hertz, it will actually get rid of this problem pretty much altogether. For example, now, if I go back to YouTube and go back to full screen, I no longer have the bright green flashes and screen tearing that I was uh, observing on the 4K display. So the graphics card could be a bit sketchy, but for the time being, it seems to be fairly effective uh, at the lower resolution. I also installed a couple of stress test programs for the CPU and GPU to determine system stability. So I'll start the CPU test first. This is M prime, which is kind of a variant of the Mersenne prime finder. And I'll just start it up in its generic uh, torture test. Now, if I go to my system monitor, you can see all 12 logical cores, that is all six physical cores, are at 100% utilization. So we have the CPU basically pegged at 100%. Now, I ran this for about an hour yesterday, and this worked absolutely fine. Uh, the CPU heatsink remained cool to the touch the entire time. So that's really quite good. And I can start up the graphics test simultaneously. So it's going to start up a windowed version of, I think, this Gmark. And as you can see, 
this is working really quite well. Uh, no real problems with GPU stability either. So this tells me basically that the components, at least on the processing and graphics processing level, are absolutely fine. The GPU, uh, the NVIDIA CUDA cores should be okay. Uh, the really only issue I noticed with the graphics card was relating more to the actual like display driver, display output, the HDMI controller, rather than the core of the graphics card, which is the GPU itself. One thing I want to make note of is that even with the CPU and GPU stress tests running concurrently, the whole system only draws about 200 watts at the wall. This indicates that the 750 watt power supply, which was actually an Amazon purchase for my previous mining project, is actually totally overkill. You may remember this power supply from a previous video in which I did a teardown and reverse engineering of a power supply that I purchased on AliExpress several years ago. Now this power supply was good to produce just over 200 watts before things started to overheat, and I really only used it for the 12 volt supply to run things like inverters. But at this point, I still have access to the 3 volt, 5 volt, and 12 volt rails, so I'm thinking I may connect this to an ATX power supply connector and just see if we can get the board to operate from it. If that indeed works, it truly will be a fully AliExpress based computer, really representing what you can build with the least expensive components available on the market. Alright, I've gone ahead and connected all my voltage rails to the posts on this uh, power supply. I did go ahead and also add a motherboard power connector as well. I only had one, and the motherboard does have two connectors for the CPU motherboard power, so we'll have to see if it'll work with just one. I also went ahead and added a line cord so we can get 120 volt power into the power supply as well. All right, I've connected the new power supply to the motherboard and the SSD. I guess all that's left now is to try powering it on. So I learned quite a few interesting things about how the ATX power supply standard works. So there's this pin that I had already mentioned, which was the power good pin, that the power supply asserts high when the power supply is okay. What I didn't realize was this pin has to be asserted within a certain period of time after the motherboard calls for power. If you just hold it high all the time, the motherboard won't actually start up. So what I've done is I just put a toggle switch on this pin, and then I just connected, uh, I basically turned on the motherboard using the power switch jumper, and then within a couple of, I think it was about 500 milliseconds was the standard, I flipped the switch on, and this allowed it to post. I did end up making one additional change on the power supply. I actually reversed my always on configuration, and I also got rid of my bypass to the under voltage lockout protection. In doing so, I was able to then connect the ATX power cable directly to the original connectors on the power supply so the power supply can properly negotiate the power on timing with the motherboard. Alright, so I've been running the GPU and CPU tests concurrently for about 5 minutes and I haven't seen any critical failures yet. If we go over to the power meter, you can see here we are drawing about 230 watts at the wall, which is a little bit more than we were with the other power supply, indicating slightly lower efficiency. But again, this is not uh, rated 80 plus uh, bronze or whatever the other one was. If we take a look back at the screen, we can see that uh, GeeMark, the GPU test, is still running. And if we switch back over to our CPU load, we're still pegged on all six cores. All 12 logical cores are at 100%. So yeah, everything's working reasonably well. And it is notable to keep in mind that this is kind of an artificial load condition. Even in like heavy duty gaming, you wouldn't really be likely to see both 100% CPU utilization on all cores and full GPU utilization. Well, a couple of weeks went by since the last time I filmed for this video and out of the blue, I got a package in the mail from Buananji with the CPU cooler in it. So I don't exactly know why it took an extra two weeks for this to show up, but uh, this is definitely the CPU cooler for that motherboard, and it is compatible with the original uh, 1366 mount. Since my last video update, I've actually put all the components of the PC onto this black piece of uh, fiberboard, and this is actually, I've actually put small feet on the bottom of it, so I can either hang it up or set it on a table or other surface. So I'll go ahead now and replace this cooler. Since building this PC, I've been using it primarily as a media PC, gaming PC, and a folding at home client. So folding at home is basically just a shared distributed computing resource platform for research scientists to get access to inexpensive computational resources where they can simulate protein folding. 
The majority of folding at home projects are actually COVID-19 related, so I feel like it's quite cool to be able to put the new hardware that I built towards doing such a task. Now what I can show you here is that my current CPU usage is consistently at 100% as I've set folding at home to allocate the entire CPU towards its operation. And what I can do here is look at the temperatures. So I will do the sensors command in Linux. And as we can see, the processor cores are running anywhere from 39 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees or actually 47 degrees Celsius. So reasonably cool considering this is at 100% usage. This is with the deep cooler CPU cooler from Amazon. What I'm going to do now is install the one that came with the Wanon G motherboard and see how these temperatures change with the same workload. The new CPU cooler is installed. While we're waiting for the CPU temperature to equilibrate, I can make note of the very nice blue LEDs that the Wanon G heatsink fans ship with. Let's take a look at our CPU temperatures now. If I run sensors again and I scroll up, we're actually not that far off from where we were before. Before, remember, the highest temperature measured was 47 degrees Celsius, and the average was in the high uh, to mid 40s. Now we're at about 52 degrees Celsius maximum, uh, with the average around 50. So it's definitely the case that the new heatsink from Wananji does not perform quite as well as the deep cool one from Amazon. Uh, however, this is still relatively comparable and certainly nowhere near our maximum limits on CPU temperatures, considering we're at full load. Though I would definitely consider this a win for using the original hardware provided by the manufacturer. Well, it's been about two months since I filmed those earlier parts of the video, and this machine has been absolutely bulletproof. I've been running basically the continuous operation of the uh, folding at home client. I've been using it for gaming, media applications, all sorts of things, and it's been just rock solid. No trouble at all. Uh, everything's been working great. Uh, the SSD has proven also to be highly reliable, even under very heavy paging uh, and swap file usage conditions. The only issue I actually ran into was the power supply had some issues with its mains filter capacitors. The original ones started leaking and it didn't affect the machine, it kept operating, but I went ahead and shut it down and preemptively replaced them with some fresh ones just to make sure that wasn't going to be an issue. Other than that, everything's been absolutely great and it's been a super reliable machine. So in conclusion, I would say based on my experience that buying the AliExpress builders kits and building machines from bottom priced uh, equipment in general has seemed to work well and even for aggressive workloads has been really quite a good fit. Now your results may vary depending on the vendors, the particular hardware you get, and your particular use case conditions, but in this case it's been a real win. So hopefully you enjoyed watching this video. Thanks for watching Dielectric videos and I will see you in the next video.